In uh, 1971, uh, two American researchers, Eisenberg and Chabot, published a paper in Journal of Applied Physics, and they, they used the title, in the title of the paper, the word diamond-like carbon. As the words say, diamond-like carbon, so it's carbon that is similar to diamond. And this was the first paper that started a large uh, research field uh, since 1971 until now, nowadays, so over 40 years, almost 50 years. And uh, diamond-like carbon is now applied almost everywhere. Everybody, everybody who's listening to this is using it, but they don't know. And I want to make one particular example, which is the hard disk. Of course, the hard disk has a part of it, which is the ma magnetic part, because you do magnetic storage. But what people probably do not know, that a very important part of the, of the hard disk is the coating that is on the top of the magnetic disk and on the bottom of the reading head. So a modern hard disk can store one terabyte of information per square inch. And what is limiting the amount of information that you can store inside an hard disk is the dimension of the bit. The more you make your bit smaller, of course, the more you can put in the same space. But if it's too small, what happens is what is called the super paramagnetic limit. You have the spins, the electron spins, that are all aligned, let's say when you write one, but if the bit is too small, thermal excitation, we just disalign them, and so you will lose your information very quickly over time. It cannot be stored for 10 years or whatever the industry standard is. So what happened is uh, originally, from the 1950s, where this technology started. I don't know if you remember, but in the 1950s and 60s, a five megabyte uh, hard drive was the size of a car, of a modern car, five megabyte. And in the 1970s, 200, 300 megabyte were more or less the size of a person. Nowadays, if you go to a, any shop and you buy crisps, they give you as a gift some, you know, data storage for one terabit, you know, but it's a joke, it's not the case, but you need to realize how things changed. And originally, the uh, distance between the reading head and the hard drive was very, very large, and of the orders of tens of nanometers. And the bits were written along the surface of the uh, uh, magnetic uh, disk, so like my arm. They were very long and thin. And then they started reducing the distance between the reading head and the surface of the drive, and they became smaller, maybe like my finger or the, to or the top of my finger, but they were still with this shape, long and thin. And then they be if you approach too much, they become too small, and you cannot store the information. Around 2000, 2002, somebody had the brilliant idea, what if we rotate the bit 90 degrees? The volume is the same exactly the same, but the cross-section is much smaller. So I can put a lot of them, like my finger, like this. Of course, I, I can put a lot more fingers if I put them like this than you can, if I could put them like this. So I can put, it's almost like my hand, if I go from here to here, the ratio is about 10 times. And that's exactly what happens. What, what is called perpendicular recording, I can put 10 times more information on the same space. And that allowed to reach uh, what we have now in the market, one terabit per square inch. But that requires a distance between the reading head and the surface of the hard drive of only between two and three nanometers. This is about the thickness of 10 layers of graphene. So it's an extremely small distance. On the top of it, the reading head is not kept in a certain position by a piezo mechanism or anything. It's actually literally flying on the top of the surface of the hard drive. So when the hard drive spins like a plane, it takes off, it flies like an airplane. It's, not, it's actually exactly what happens. The head is flying like an airplane, and then like an airplane, it, it, it lands and takes off. So you, what you need is a runway, and the plane has to be able to land and to take off. Land and take off, and the surface of the runway 
cannot be destroyed every time the plane takes off or lands. And that's why you need this diamond-like carbon, a carbon coating which is similar to diamond, very strong, that protects the magnetic part of the disk and allows the red to land and, and take off all the time. On the top of it, you don't want the magnetic part of the disk to be affected by corrosion, acids, and all sorts of environment. And so it has to be very dense, very compact, in order not to avoid uh, corrosion or damage of the surface of the magnetic uh, part of the hard disk. And this is the challenge that diamond-like carbon has been facing for the past uh, 40 years. But now we are stuck, so we are one terabit per square inch. We cannot make it smaller with the current magnetic technology, so there is another challenge that we are facing. How do we go from one terabit per square inch to 10 terabit or 50 terabit per square inch? One solution is to make sure that the spins, they stay together more closely or more, uh, uh, with more force of what they do at the moment. So we need a material that is so-called harder, an harder magnetic material, higher coercivity, which means that the interaction between the spins is much stronger than what we have at the moment, so it's much harder to disalign them. But there is a problem, because in the hard disk, we need to write and erase information. And in order to write and, and erase, we need a magnetic field. If the bits are so hard to disalign, they will be so hard, so much harder to write and erase. So we will need to put a massive magnetic field inside our storage devices that is not realistic. So people have now come up with a solution that is called the heat-assisted magnetic recording. So you take a magnetic uh, material that is with much higher coercivity, so you can make bits that are much smaller, but then in order to write and erase, your magnetic field has to be supplemented by a laser. So the laser will heat for a very small fraction of time the surface of the disk. You will be able to write and erase with a small magnetic field, and then it cools down. So now we have a bigger challenge. We need a carbon coating that is survives the high temperature, which can be 400 or 500 Celsius, and at the same time survives the laser, and at the same time is much thinner than two or three nanometers, what we used at the moment. In fact, to achieve more than 10 terabit per square inch, we need below one nanometer, like 0 0.8 nanometer, which is two, three times the thickness of graphene. So work that is going on at the moment is to try and see if we can substitute the carbon coating that is two or three nanometer thick with only one or two or three layers of graphene. And preliminary results in the labs have shown that storage densities up to 10 terabit per square inch could be reached with this technology. This is something that is not yet on the market and we expect in the next few years, hopefully, for this uh, heat-assisted magnetic recording technology uh, to, reach, uh, to reach the market and the, and the final application. But of course, there are many challenges I had in order to achieve this. So this is an example of how this technology of diamond-like carbon that started in 1970s is now present in one billion, not million, one billion are disks that are produced every year. Another example that people may not know that rods or blades I don't want to uh, specify what brand, but the major brands of razor blades have the blade coated with a thickness of about one micron of diamond-like carbon because uh, it improves the performance when it comes to shaving. And another possible application of this material is the coating of uh, plastic bottles in order to store beer uh, in plastic bottles instead of storing it in glass bottles of, or, or metal bottles. And again, the properties of this material initiated in 1971 are now widely applied. If we look at diamond-like carbon and graphene uh, from the point of view of theory, there's a big difference. Diamond-like carbon is an amorphous material. So you don't have simply two atoms per unit cell like in the case of graphene. So many calculations in graphene can be done by hand or by the computer, but you need to deal with a very small unit cell. When it comes to diamond-like carbon, you need to do molecular dynamics. You need to do extremely 
heavy calculation with supercomputers in order to understand what is going on. And often, you are limited to 60 or 100 atoms that you can study, and not even a cell because they complete an amorphous material. So the theoretical challenges in amorphous carbon are much, much bigger than the ones that we have in uh, graphene. And many of them have been left unsolved. So what happens is that over the years, because it's too, it's, it's too difficult to do fundamental theory, people have done semi-empirical approaches. So they've taken some experimental data, some general principles of theory, and constructed correlations that people can use. And most of these correlations are not uh, uh, fully understood. For example, uh, in the past two or three years, uh, with uh, the collaboration of IBM in Switzerland, uh, theoretical calculations have been done in diamond-like carbon to understand how to utilize this material to store information directly. So unlike the hard disk, where the carbon is a coating, you can also directly create resistive memories in diamond-like carbon. And you can do that by applying a voltage and creating conductive filaments within the insulating matrix of the diamond-like carbon. The theory of how this filament is created, and especially how the filament is removed when you write and rewrite, is not concluded. And, there are, uh, and it required very sophisticated tools uh, of investigation in order to get to a reasonable picture of what is going on at the moment.